So just a little bit more on the difference between arterial and venous clots. Um, you know, these are, these are different things entirely. The arteries are not the veins. Uh, they look different. The blood flowing through them is different. And so we really have to think of these as separate problems. Um, again, just to kind of illustrate graphically what arterial clots are, um, a heart attack is probably the most commonly recognized one, a blood clot that finds its way into one of the blood vessels that supplies the heart muscle, um, a stroke if a blood clot ends up in the brain. Um, you know, you can have clots that plug up the arteries in the lower extremities as well, and we call that peripheral arterial vascular disease, um, and some of the typical symptoms are listed here. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that because our focus is really venous thrombosis, but just to illustrate uh, what those things look like. In terms of venous clots, there's really two types of clots in the leg, and it's important to distinguish between them. We think that the underlying mechanisms are very similar, um, but certainly one problem is a much bigger one than the other. So a superficial thrombophlebitis, um, what this means is a clot and inflammation. Itis means inflammation. Um, a, a clot or an occlusion of a vein with inflammatory reaction around it in one of the superficial veins. And this cartoon here shows you the typical pattern of superficial veins in the lower extremity. These veins are superficial because they're on top of all of the muscles. So these things lie just underneath the skin and they're in the sort of fatty connective tissue, but they're on top of all the muscle layers. And that's what distinguishes the superficial veins from the deep veins. The deep veins are tucked underneath the muscles. Um, they're bigger veins, there's fewer of them, there's more blood flowing through them. But this is the place where deep vein thrombosis occurs. So, Superficial thrombophlebitis can sometimes look a lot like a DVT. Um, you have pain, redness, and swelling, um, but it's more on the surface, it's more localized. You tend not to have diffuse swelling of the whole leg. And I'll show you some more pictures of these things in a bit. Um, it's the deep vein thromboses that can travel to the lungs and cause pulmonary embolism. These, embolism. these things don't tend to travel anywhere. They're, they're small vessels. Um, the clots aren't very mobile. They tend to be fairly localized, and they're not really risk factors for pulmonary embolism other than to say that the things that lead to this can sometimes lead to that. So um, it's important to keep these things separate. Um, just illustrating further uh, a deep vein thrombosis, this cartoon shows a, shows a big clot in, in the, the femoral vein. Um, if part of that breaks loose and, and uh, illustrated here, embolizes into the lung, you get a pulmonary embolism. So just a final word on arterial versus venous clots, and then we're going to spend the rest of the time going over venous thrombosis and some of the uh, unique details of, of that particular clotting problem. Again, I want to I emphasize the difference really from the very beginning all through the end. So the, the vessels are different, the risk factors are different, the clots look different under the microscope, and because of all that, our treatments are totally different as well. So arteries are firm, thick-walled structures. Blood flows very rapidly through the arteries. There's lots of shear stress. Um, on the other hand, veins are, are very slow flow, low pressure systems. The blood kind of trickles back towards the heart. The, the vessels themselves are very thin walled, they're floppy. Um, so they look totally different from that perspective. If you think about the risk factors for arterial and venous thrombosis, they're also very different. So when we think about strokes and heart attacks, we think about things that cause vascular disease, things that we all know about smoking and high cholesterol and diabetes and high blood pressure, and bad family history. Those are things that put you at risk for underlying vascular disease. And when we say it that way, we mean arterial vascular disease. The second thing that distinguishes arterial clots from venous clots is the role of platelets. So excess activation of platelets is a much bigger part of what leads to an arterial thrombotic event than a venous thrombotic event, and that's partly why our treatments are different. If you think about the veins, again, think about it as a floppy, thin-walled, low-pressure, slow-flow system. So this problem of stasis, stasis is another way of saying blood sitting around. When blood doesn't flow as fast as, it, as it's supposed to, it tends to clot. And we don't really get stasis in the arterial circulation because it's under high pressure, high flow. But by the time it trickles all the way down through the capillaries and starts coming back to the heart, most of that pressure head is lost and the flow is quite slow. It doesn't take a lot of extra, uh, extra manipulation of the system really to get stasis. And when you have stasis, when you have blood sitting around in a vein, it's going to tend to clot. When we put people in bed in, in the hospital, when we do surgery and immobilize people, that all contributes to stasis. And we'll talk more about that. As far as underlying mechanisms, I've already said that platelet activation isn't such a big part of the problem for venous thrombosis. The problem here is really regulation of thrombin generation. So when, once that secondary hemostasis, the second step in the clotting process, starts to kick in, you have to shut that off, as I said before. And that's where most of the problems come in with the currently known genetic thrombophilias. The problem is regulating the generation of that clot, shutting off the process when it's, when it's time to be done. Problems doing that lead to excess generation of clot, and that's what we think underlies most episodes of venous thrombosis. 
If you look at these clots under the microscope, um, just to kind of, again, reiterate what I've been saying, if you look at an arterial clot, it's mostly a wad of platelets. There's a little bit of fibrin. This, the fibrin is the gooey clot-like stuff that's uh, produced from that second step in, in the clotting cascade or the clotting uh, process that I talked about. So mostly platelets, a little bit of fibrin. If you look at a venous clot, it's just the opposite. It's mostly fibrin. It's mostly gooey clot and a few platelets stuck in there. So very different looking under the microscope. Not surprising when you think about how you got to that point. And so from this understanding then comes a very, very different approach to prevention and treatment. When we think about prevention of arterial clots, strokes, and heart attacks, we think about risk factor modification. We think about don't smoke, treat your diabetes, control your blood pressure, control your cholesterol. All those sorts of things are extremely important in preventing arterial clots, but they really don't do a whole lot to help prevent venous clots. Um, in terms of medications, antiplatelet drugs like aspirin are very effective at preventing arterial thrombotic events, but they really don't offer any protection at all against venous thrombosis because the mechanisms are totally different. So we have to think differently about venous thrombosis. In terms of prevention, uh, we'll talk a lot about prophylaxis. Prophylaxis is anything you do to prevent something bad from happening. It's at least one way of looking at it. And, uh, and prophylaxis against venous thrombosis is a very important part of our strategy to help avoid this problem. And then we use certain medications called blood thinners. We'll talk a little bit more about those uh, in just a bit. 